Hey everyone, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date climate outlook for all of our friends in New Jersey. Y'all have been telling me to get to New Jersey already for quite a while, but I wanted to see if you were going to get any more of those earthquakes. That one on April 5th was pretty wild, and I find this very interesting. So I heard about this earthquake mostly from friends. It didn't get a lot of media attention because it didn't destroy very much, but it was the strongest earthquake to affect New Jersey since 1783. And a lot of the people I know who experienced it said that a big sound came up from the earth from underneath their feet. So I was like, oh. And I'm not a geologist, but I wanted to try and understand it, especially because there's so much risk from land subsidence in New Jersey. I was like, is this a land subsidence quake or not? And, you know, just starting at Wikipedia, because I'm not a geologist, I was surprised that in this well-cited article, there's really not agreement on what the causative fault for the earthquake was. There's two potential faults listed here. So I was like, that's kind of weird. Let's go to the USGS. Let's see what they say. You see here, the USGS doesn't mention either of those faults. It says it didn't occur near a plate boundary. And basically, the earthquakes are going to earthquake, could be reactivated at any time. So I thought that was a little unsettling. And it seemed to me like it was at least worth mentioning that there is an active body of research looking at what's going on with land subsidence in New Jersey and earthquake activity. Folks, all this is a long way of my saying this is a rough one. So brace up. I'm going to give you a real quick background so you know where to find stuff yourself. Then I'm going to walk you through the outlook for New Jersey. We're going to be seeing a lot of potential land loss in New Jersey. I use the Fifth National Climate Assessment as a major source of information for these outlooks. If you want to follow along with the figures, go to chapters, down to all figures. They're downloadable. I'll refer to them all by number. I sometimes also use information from the NCA5 Atlas. The data sets that power the NCA5 Atlas are publicly available. We were able to port those in to this Tableau page. Some AR volunteers led by Dustin have done an incredible job getting that same great publicly available data into a more user-friendly format. It allows us to extrapolate new information from the NCA5 data and it lets you look at a lot of the information in a convenient side-by-side -side, where you can look at 1.5C, which I think is worth pointing out is where we are now. We've been at or above 1.5C for a year, according to this information from the EU's climate outfit, the Copernicus Institute. So a lot of these tools were able to look between 1.5C and 2C, which is the next sort of step up as we look into a warming climate. I think that it's close enough, it's likely we're going to get there, and we got to handle this problem one step at a time. Another tool that we'll be using for this outlook is the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer. It's very powerful. You can enter your address and see how things are going to impact you right where you live. It's very easy to model the different water level scenarios with this slider to the left of the screen. I think it's important to show you where everything's coming from because I want you to be doing your own research. I want you to be able to confirm everything I report without too much work on your end. At American Resiliency, we use these tools and especially the Fifth National Climate Assessment because they represent the highest consensus climate science available. Your dollars paid for the development and review of the National Climate Assessment and you deserve access to the information in this document. As a matter of congressional mandate, there's no direct federal funding for communication to the public about the National Climate Assessment. That motivated me to found American Resiliency in 2021. We're the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information to the public, and we run on your donations. Thanks for sticking to the preamble. We're going to do something different today. We're going to start with sea level rise. New Jersey is a state that gets like a cute hug from the ocean, but now it's not cute at all. We're going to model three feet of sea level rise, which is pretty much mainstream at this point, and 10 feet, which would be a higher end rise estimate. We shouldn't expect that three feet is going to roll in then in the next three years. I'm talking about in like the next 10, 20 years, definitely in your lifetime, definitely something you're going to want to think about if you're interested in property values in New Jersey. We're getting a lot of troubling info coming in from Antarctica, indicating that we want to be modeling those higher end estimates than previous consensus science suggested. And you could say to me, Emily, I don't want to model 10 feet of sea level rise. I don't think that's realistic. But look, what if you get hit by a hurricane again? You know, that's going to drive the water in. If you want, think about that 10 foot modeling as a storm surge picture. You can imagine the water going back out again. 
but it's important to look at it, especially for New Jersey, because you have some of the most vulnerable cities in the country. And we're going to look at that starting with Atlantic City. You can see that with three feet of sea level rise, Atlantic City would be severely compromised. This is going to totally mess up all of the utility infrastructure in Atlantic City. And if we look at 10 feet, it's gone. And this is the case for all of those key type islands all around New Jersey. It's very serious. Looking at another hotspot for trouble for New Jersey, we're centered over Newark so that you can see a large area. And I want to show you that at three feet, we start to see a lot of land loss in this highly developed area. In a 10 feet scenario, there's open water way far up here. Look at this. There's open water all the way up past Hackensack. It's pretty intense. New Jersey, this is the worst. This is some of the most serious volume of land loss to a developed area that we see anywhere in the U.S. And unfortunately, it's not confined to New York Bay or to the islands. As we look over here, it's where we get sort of riverine estuarial action. There are also big changes projected. Let's zoom in a little bit. Burlington is a good case study for the sort of damage that we're expecting to see along the river associated with sea level rise. At three feet, we start to see land loss in those marshy areas where you might have high tide flooding. They're getting really big. And if we ever had a really big rise, we would have loss of a lot of homes, a lot of development damaged and lost. And you can see here that some of the areas that are threatened are going to be areas where we could have major pollution events. We could have major groundwater impacting events if we don't clean up before the water comes in. Look, I gotta give it to you straight, New Jersey. I see this level of potential damage and it makes me think that I have zero clue how your state would be able to afford it. I don't see how this isn't gonna have a horrifying impact on the state budget. Even with that three foot scenario, you're getting whacked super hard. So this is a very difficult outlook for the state. As we get into the other figures now, it's important to remember that land loss as we move into the rest of this outlook, you're going to see it's not so bad. There's a lot in the other figures where it doesn't look so bad for New Jersey. Pretty mild to moderate level of change. But I feel like we got to look right at the bad part first for you to make an informed call here. I feel like it would be irresponsible to give you any good news first in this case, because the level of challenge to the state budget alone makes it difficult to see a strong path forward. All right, we're looking at our first figure now, 2.11. This is where we're going to look at changes to seasonal extremes, to changes in temps around the year. We're going to focus in on the heat figures now, and you can see this is too big to be useful, so let's go to a snip. So you might see at a glance, this is not terrible. Much of New Jersey is looking at a two-week-ish hot season increase during the day. About a 10 additional days a year, over 95 projected a 2C for much of the state. The nighttime warming is more severe and then that daytime hot season warming for you. In the warm nights figure that you see on the right, you can see yourself, there's a major urban heat island effect. Your densest areas, you're looking at an additional month where the nights don't get below 70. That's going to be expensive in terms of energy use and it's unpleasant to experience when the night doesn't cool off. But I think it's worth noting that many of these most impacted areas will be maybe underwater. I guess what I'm saying here is, if you're a long-term thinker, this is a state where you want to keep the biggest problem in the front view. Let's look at changes to the winter. Back in 2.11, we're zooming in on the loss of cold days. And you can see again here, hot spots for cold loss in your most developed areas. With these areas facing about four weeks of cold loss, the rest of the state about three weeks. That tells us about duration. That tells us that the cold season is going to be shorter. For cold season intensity, we're using information from figure 11.3, projected changes in plant hardiness zones. Let's go to another SNP here, but I want to show you where the info is coming from. All right, so we've got it snipped out of the contemporary and the 2C projection. And you see, this is a big winter change. We're shifting multiple color bands throughout the state. There are parts of the state that are seeing a 10 degree lift in winter lows, like up here in the north of the state. And down here, down by the water by Delaware, you're looking at like a 10 degree lift in winter lows. For this part of the state, it's more like a five degree lift. Okay, so if you're well away from the water, things look pretty good, relatively good summer conservation. The winter change isn't overwhelming. If you're close to Pennsylvania up in the north side of the state, 
this is locally a very stable outlook for you. Like if you're up by Sparta, it's very stable, very locally. Let's look at precipitation changes though. Let's build this picture up. In figure 210, the national precipitation changes overview. At 2C, you're looking good. You're not in the same heavier rain band that we see across Maine and Vermont, which is being associated already with pretty intense flooding. You're looking at about a 5% total increase of precipitation, which is nice. With a little bit of a warmer summer, you need a little bit more water. So this kind of is a good even outlook on overall precipitation. But if we look at extreme storms, deluge type storms in figure 212, I'm sorry to report that there's a very conserved repeating pattern across all three of these sub figures. And let's zoom down here and look at it. Right here in the bay, where you're most vulnerable to sea level rise, you're going to be seeing more intense storms dropping more rain per storm. I could see that potentially driving storm surge into this extremely vulnerable area. New Jersey, I'm sorry, this one is really bad, and I wish things weren't stacking this way. It's a terrible combo punch there. The sea level rise issue and the storms looking to hit you right where you're most vulnerable to storm surge. We're talking about thousands and thousands of people here who are going to maybe lose their homes in this projected future and millions more who are going to be living in a state with a huge freaking budget problem. This level of projected infrastructure damage is serious. Like to anyone who's interested in waste systems and water infrastructure, this is a bad outlook. This is an extreme level of nastiness projected. When you think about how this outlook is going to meet up with the sewer infrastructure, any further change in the water table here is going to push on already stressed out-of-date systems. If you're up in the foothills in northwest New Jersey, you got a good shot there. That's a pretty solid resilience outlook. Getting serious about potentially flooding major storms, those do look like a challenge coming your way. But communities can build resilience and respond to those concerns, particularly if they're not also responding to like 19 other serious emerging problems. Having one area to focus on is a big bonus, but even though you've got that great local potential in Northwest New Jersey, I'm still concerned about the serious challenges facing your immediate surrounding area. There are a lot of people really nearby you who are gonna be in more challenging situations, which means there's gonna be stress to your area too. The only response that might save this big developed area by you is gonna be going full Netherlands on the whole situation. But like how much seawall can we build really? Because the whole coastal outlook is very challenging almost all over from Norfolk to Boston. New Jersey is one of the centers of a large regional coastal problem. And I'm concerned about our ability to mount a unified response to a problem of this scale. Bottom line, summer heat projections aren't bad for New Jersey. The daytime heat's not too bad. The wet bulb temperature increase, let me show you. You can see on our wet bulb risk tool, not a lot of change in much of New Jersey. Those areas that are bumping up our risk level from 1.5 to 2, they're staying at level 3 or below. That's the sort of heat risk we have the cultural and technological tools to deal with today. I don't think a lot of people are likely to die of heat in New Jersey. Always a bonus. So if you live in New Jersey now and you like New Jersey, you should stay in New Jersey if you want. You know, make a living, enjoy the beach. But don't kid yourself that this is a generational place to be. If I were a New Jersey person, I would definitely stay, but I would own zero properties in New Jersey. This is a place to rent, especially if you're anywhere near the water. Any wealth you might dream of holding on to for yourself and your family, hold it some other way. For the right guy, this outlook could make a convincing argument for why a cool boat with a big cabin is a reasonable investment. But if you want to invest like for real or in real estate, look towards Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania looks really solid. New Jersey, I know you all are smart. For the vast majority of people in New Jersey, getting ready is going to mean staying a little light on your feet, having a fallback plan. Until then, I think if you want to stay put, that's fine. Enjoy life where you are now. Put pressure on local authorities to clean up as many potentially inundated industrial sites as you can and make sure you got that fallback plan. Make sure you're not invested in real estate in a vulnerable area. I am wishing you all the best. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks for watching. I wanna thank everyone in the AR community for your contributions that keep this nonprofit going. If you wanna donate, there's a link on the about page of our YouTube channel or on the top bar of our website, www.americanresiliency.org. 
I'm very grateful to our donors, to our volunteers, to everyone spreading the word online, and especially to everyone doing the work on the ground. Thanks for getting ready with me and talk with you again soon.